Ephesians chapter 6, a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, jump down to verse 10. Um, Ephesians 6 and 10. I want to read that just by way of introduction um, and just to kind of lay some foundation. We've been talking on prayer for quite some time now. We spent a long time in the book of 2 Chronicles 7, um, verse 14. And so I want to um, shift a little bit and allow God to um, move and have, <clears throat> have his way in our midst. If you're there, let me hear a big amen. amen. Good. Here's what Ephesians chapter 6 says. Um, well, do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, yeah. prayer changes things. Prayer changes tell, things. tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Other neighbor. Say, prayer changes, things. prayer changes things. Now, I don't know where this message is going to go. Um, I'm just going to say that because I'm kind of in this funky place, right? Um, but I'm crazy enough to believe that. I'm crazy enough to believe that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm crazy enough to believe that. I am. I'm crazy enough to believe that. I'm, I, you know, uh, I know you guys are tired of hearing this song and dance, but the more, the more I, I was preparing for the message today, the more the Lord showed me that the reason that I believe that is because I'm a product of that. You kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm a product of that. I wouldn't be in front of you today. Buried not for the, the prayer of the saints, right? And so I, I think we ought to get there because we're losing too many people because we're not doing that. Yeah, okay? I'm crazy enough to believe it. So I want to show you how crazy James is, and then we're going to talk about that. So let me read um, Ephesians first. Here's what it says. Finally, um, some of your translation says, my brothers, I'm in the ESV. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then it says in verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Verse 14 says, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16 says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pray how often? How? In the spirit with what? All prayers and supplication. That's, that's it right there. I, wanna, I, want to, um, I want to hang out there for a little while. Pray at all times. So in other words, when I read this um, again, it says that once I stand firm um, with my belt, I should be praying. With the breastplate, I should be praying. With the shoes on my feet, I should be praying. Um, when I'm dealing with the gospel, I should be praying. When I have the shield of faith, I should be praying. Um, you kind of get what I'm saying? When I put my helmet on, I should be praying. When I go into the Word, I should be praying. And there never is a time where I should not be praying. Oh, my goodness. Wow, this is heavy. Isn't it something? There never should be a time where I am not praying. The problem is, as I go into, go over to James now, and um, let's see how far we get. If we don't get far, um, we're going to pick up where we left off. Uh, I need you all to put that song in the planning center for next week. Amen? The same song. Is that all right? Yeah, just y'all leave that. Do not take that out of planning center. Amen. Um, yeah, I want to I wanna do that. Um, yeah, we need a move. Until we get a move, we're going to stay there. So here's James, right? In the book of James, we've been talking about prayer. And let me apologize for not giving you much literary context about James. I want to, um, that's not the intent of the message, even though James has a good thing that he lays out where he gets to where he wants to go and all that good stuff. But I just want to jump down to talking a little more about prayer, picking up um, in verse 13 onwards. And I just want to hit a couple of things that I think is very, very paramount as it relates to what the Scripture is saying. And I want us to kind of really take some time processing the truth uh, the veracity of this text that's in front of us so we can hear and see what God is saying. The problem we have, let me say this, the problem, if I were to say to you, the church is a hospital, um, how many of you in here would believe me? It is, yeah, yeah. The problem with the church being a hospital is you got sick folk 
that have diagnosed themselves and they won't tell the doctors that they're sick. But they want to be healed. It's the problem. Right? Why? We're private. It's my business. It ain't yours. And I don't need nobody involved in my stuff. So here's how, listen to what I'm going to say carefully. So we mistakenly think we can handle it by ourselves in prayer. Listen to what I'm saying. We mistakenly think that just me and you and my little circle can handle it. And I want to say to you, God's design is a little different than that. I want you to hear me say it, right? Uh, right. Um, so, I, and I think James addressed that. I think James addressed that. And the reason we have people in God's church getting divorced and people in God's church being sick and dying and the people in God's church going through all the crazy stuff that they're going through, backsliding, all that stuff, because they're the only ones that knew about it. I'm not telling you all tell your business to gossipers. I'm not saying that, right? <laughs> but, but I'm saying there's well-intended people that, that, that God has designed and God has created to be around you to pray um, and that, that can really encourage you to, to make it through. And I want you all to hear me say this because I'm, I'm, I'm really processing this even as I'm speaking in front of you because um, this text is, is opening my eyes to a completely different place that the miraculous can happen today. It can. It really, really can. The miraculous can, can happen today. Um, um, that woman with the issue of blood, check this out, right? I'm going to say this and then because I haven't processed it yet. She spent a lot of money with a lot of physicians. You can't get what I'm saying? But listen to this. It wasn't until she met Jesus in the public square and put her business... It wasn't until then. You kind of get what I'm saying? It wasn't until then. I'm pretty sure she had prayer meetings. I'm pretty sure she done things by herself. But it wasn't until she got, you kind of get what I'm saying? Y'all get this? You get what I'm saying? And I think there's something about communal prayer that we miss sometimes that kind of messes us up, that we don't miss what God would have us to go. So I want us to look. Let me read this text, and then we're going to walk through it. And um, I'm going to come back to it next week because I'm telling you right now I won't be able to finish it, but I want to begin the process. So notice what it says in verse 13. Let me read verse 13 through 18. Here's what it says. Uh, if you're there, say amen. amen. Okay, James 5.13. If anyone among you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Lord, we got a problem with that. And pray for one another that you may be healed. And then I love this. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I'm hoping I can get to that. Let me just read this illustration. Elijah was a man um, with a mature, with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. That is heaven. Repeat out of me. Say self. self. Prayer changes things. So let me walk you through this text as, as, as expediently as I can just to kind of point some things. We're going to pick it up again Wednesday, and then we're going to flesh it out even more next week. He opens up by saying this in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let him sing praise. Okay? There's five things I want you to take away from the text today. And the first one I want you to understand is this. That Christians should respond to all situations in life with prayer. Okay? So uh, hear me first of all. Christians, meaning you, meaning I. And I wish I had translated that word Christians a little differently. Because I would say the body should respond to all situations of life with prayer. Meaning there ought not be anything that I take for granted and don't think it is worth God's time going to in prayer. Does that make sense, right? Here's Ephesians chapter 6. We just threw it. In all things, pray. Above all, pray, right? After you've put on the helmet, after you've done everything that you need to do, 
pray, after you've been through the struggle. I mean, wherever we find ourselves, we ought to spend time praying. Chapter, verse 13 says it this, this, is any among you suffering? And I love that word suffering because suffering kind of implies that if I find myself going through anything, if I am stressing, I am suffering. If I can't pay the bills, I am suffering. Come on. If my marriage is failing, I am suffering. If I'm about to lose my job, I am suffering. Suffering doesn't necessarily mean physical physical persecution. Wherever I find myself, Scripture saying, prayer is in order, right? Then it even goes to this thing where it says that if, if I'm happy, I'm cheerful, we're good at that. We are good at this part where it talks about sing praise because when it comes to testimony service, bless the Lord, save up, saints have been saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, that with fire, and then here's the testimony, the Lord blessed me with a raise. But very few of us come and say, my husband has gotten on my nerve this week. I need the body to pray. <laughs> Preaching you meddling now, right? You, here's a word I'm going to use later on. No accountability because we're too individual and we miss the nuance of what James is communicating to us as it relates to the importance of prayer, okay? So let, let me just give you a couple of things I want to kind of point to this so you can understand what prayer really is. Here's a couple of things. We should view prayer as another, I love this, revolutionary tactic, not a resignation to a situation. Just keep your eyes on the top one for a moment. The reason I read Ephesians chapter 6, because Ephesians chapter 6 kind of implies that we're going to war. Ah. And here's what Ephesians chapter 6 says. The wrestle is not against flesh and blood. Come on, are you with me? But against principalities and powers and spiritual rulers in high places. So it says put on the whole armor so when the day of evil come, you may be able to take your stand. The problem with my interpretation of the day of evil, I only see it as something external and I don't see it as me going through life. It's revolutionary. It's a revolutionary tactic. That means when you say pray for me, I am literally going to war on your behalf. You got to get that. You got to get that, right? It's I am engaging the forces of heaven. I am engaging, engaging the angelic realm. Come on. I am engaging Gabriel. I, am, I wish I had somebody in here. I am engaging everything I can on your behalf. I wish I had somebody in here inviting God to join us where we find ourselves. It's revolutionary. It's revolutionary. And imagine... Here's what Scripture says. If one can put a what? Y'all know that? What two can do? Now don't stop there. Imagine what 300 can do. Imagine what 500 can do. And you got to reckon with this. The reason a lot of us can't get over the things that we're going through in life is because the demon, the devil didn't release one demon after you. Come on, he sent legions. He sent multitudes because his goal is to prevent you from getting in the kingdom of God. Why are we so ignorant? Excuse the term. I'm not calling anybody ignorant. It's just a word I'm using. Why are we so ignorant to think we can fight him by ourselves? I remember Katanya and I, we've been married a long time. And you guys heard me say the first 16 years was a living hell. The reason that thing turned is because in year 16 she had enough. And she says, I need more than just me praying. So my business hit the streets. <laughs> but you see the result, right? That was me. I, I kind of hit the, the, the pack. I'm sorry about that. I got to put that on my belt, okay? So now look at the, in prayer, we enlist the aid and a ear 
of the Lord of hosts, our God, who is more, and I love this, than capable of righting our wrongs and helping us in our prayer. Okay? In prayer, we enlist the aid and ear of the Lord of hosts. Don't miss that. The aid, the help, and the ear. He listens in. And then it says, and he is more. Now, don't, 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 don't go nowhere left on me because I'm, don't miss this word. He is more than capable. Repeat that to me. Say, he's more than capable. One more time. Say, he's more than capable. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God can do it. Okay, that's all you need to say for right now. He's more than capable of righting our wrongs and helping us in our prayer. The problem is this. More times than often we go to prayer and we hear God talk. The problem is not God telling us what to do. The problem becomes we don't want to do what he's telling us to do. Because we know better than him. And so we stop praying when he tells us to stop doing what we like doing. If you're sick, it says here, if you're suffering, let him pray. If you're cheerful, let him sing praise. And it says, uh, let me look at the next one. And look at the second thing because we're going to flesh this out a little bit, okay? So here's the second thing I want you all to look at real quick. So then first thing, the second thing is this. Christians should respond to sickness. I like this. With prayer and anointing with oil. I'm going to say some direct things that we're going to flesh out in a little while. This is where I'm crazy enough to start believing some things. That we should respond to sickness with prayer. And anoint. Look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for who? The elders. Wow. I was sharing this with our elders and elders in training and ministers and deacons this morning. Call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And, uh, yeah, let me just stop at verse 14. If anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. A couple of things I want to say real quick. Sickness here, I did some, some work on this. Sickness here is not spiritual, it's physical and literal. Okay? James, James, is, James is being very, very practical here. And I want to say some harsh things that we're going to flesh out for a little while that I want you to walk through. So here's, here's what this says in English. is that if you have been diagnosed with anything, call the eldership. Let me slow down. This is making the assumption that the elders know who they are. <laughs> Come on. Can we talk, y'all, just for a little while? Can we talk for a little while? Okay. So, so if, if you're having anything that could be, my words, chronic, life-threatening, whatever, that God has allowed a prescription in Scripture, and y'all just walk this out with me. Don't give up on me yet. That when you bring it to him, he has earthly mechanism to begin the healing process. Okay. Now, hear me. I'm going to say this because somebody's crazy enough to do this. He's not saying don't go to the doctor. Say to him, you better listen to him. <laughs> yeah, <amen. laughs> but he is saying, don't forget to pray. <laughs> you got to get what I'm saying? Because it's a both and. It's a both and, right? I told you all all the time, and, and you all going to be tired of hearing this. My doctors had given up, right? They said, hey, uh, we've done surgery. We've done all we can do. Call the, um, his family in and start making funeral prep preparations. But the church hadn't stopped praying. So this is what a miracle is all about, God doing the impossible as a result of prayer. I need a move. I need a move. You kind of get what I'm saying? I don't know what your situation is, but I need a move. You kind of get what I'm saying? I need a move. Does that make sense? Right? So a couple of things that I want to process out real quick that I want you all to see through this. Now, this is very, very important to me. Um, so the proper... Uh, Prayer is a prop, the Christian's response. So here's what it says. The elders now are called to the sick person. That's, that's, that's very, very important. Um, come on, say the elders are called to them. And, and this part of the message is probably going to be a little more for eldership than it is for the church. But I want you to hear, to hear this. And then look, notice the second part. The elders are the ones that do all the praying. I hadn't seen that before. I hadn't seen that before. 
I hadn't seen that before. It's not saying that the person should not pray. And, and next week I'll, talk to, I'll flesh out that term presbyterius and tell you the importance of all of that overseer and all that good stuff, right? But it says the elders are called to the sick person and the elders do all the praying. And then if you look at verse 15, it says the person now is called worn out. And I like that because there's two different words for sick that is used there. When you look at verse 14, it says if anyone among you is sick, that's a completely different word talking about a physical ailment, sickness, this, that, and the other. And then when you get down to verse 15, it says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. That is a completely different Greek word that's used there. And that word means that the person who has been exhausted about to give up because of their situation. So it seems to say that when the elders get done, it doesn't matter how you feel. You might have been discouraged. You might have been despondent. You might have been thinking about giving up. But when they get done, there's a level of hope now that's reinstilled within you. You kind of get what I'm saying? Such that the author says the Lord will raise them up. Look at the rest of this. This is very, very important. Faith is required of the elders. This is very, very important. Not the sick person. I hadn't seen that before. Come on, y'all. I hadn't seen that before. We're going to talk about that. Look at it carefully. Look at it carefully, right? It says here, um, verse 14, if anyone is sick, let him call for the elders of the church. And then notice the, 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 uh, the, the pronoun, and let them, which goes back to the anteceding noun, which speaks to the elders, let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith coming from the anteceding noun, the prayer of faith coming from the person that you've called. Elders, hear me. This is serious business. Why? Because you're a doctor in God's hospital. <laughs> Ministers and deacons, hear me. This is serious business. Pastor Vernon, you're a doctor in God's hospital. Are you with me? So it says this. This is an implication. This is the qualifications in Timothy and Titus, right? We ought to conduct ourselves in such a way that when we open our mouth toward God, God hears. My life ought not be so raggedy that when I go to God on behalf of a sick person that God is doing this because I'm sick myself. And I ought to know so much about God and I'll talk about this a little bit, little bit, that the faith is in God's ability. You kind of get what I'm saying? And what God can do. Look at the last one. The elders pray over signifying the prone position of the sick person, right? So here, here's what has happened to church nowadays. Folk are in the hospital, and we come to prayer meeting, and we pray in church, and we have symbols. I'm praying for Sister Sally, so on and so forth. That last phrase kind of says, if Sister Sally's in the hospital, Pastor Vernon, I, yeah, I go to the hospital yes. <laughs> with, 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 with a team. Y'all get this? Yeah. And while Sister Sally's laying, yes. we are over. Don't make the mistake of thinking it's just the hospital, right? Because this is what I'm saying, sick. So if Sister Karen's marriage is messed up, we go to Sister Karen's house. Yeah, I got to say it, Brother Patrick. And then we pray over. You, you see the importance of this, right? Yeah, I can't, you kind of get it? You kind of get it? You get, you, see some of you, you ain't going to my house. <laughs> That's why your stuff's messed up. Right? <laughs> you got, remember I said, we, 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 we had, we, our home in our eyes was messed up. But in the public eyes, it looked good till we invited people into our home. Yeah. You get it? Amen. You kind of pray over kind of implies a going to. No. Where, I wish I had somebody. You, you know the story. You know the story of Jesus conducting revival. And he was in Peter, Peter's mama's house. And um, there was a sick person that the men tore up the roof to Peter's house to let the person down to the presence. There is a ministry of presence that makes a big difference. I want you all to hear me say that because sometimes we miss that. So it's very, very important. Let me review all five of these. That we're called to the sick person. We do all the praying. Um, not that the person doesn't pray. 
but the person is called worn out or exhausted. We go there to bring them up. And faith is requires of the people making the trip. I'll explain that in a little while, right? And then we pray over signifying the prone position that I'm trying to, I want you to hear that what James is arguing, it doesn't matter what the circumstance or situation, God has a prescription through prayer to fix it. I'm going to clean this up in a little while, but just stay with me, okay? Look at the next thing. Look at the next thing. And I'm moving quick. Look at the next thing. The goal of Christian prayer, I said this before, is physical healing, not spiritual cleansing. I need to point this out because I'm stressing the physical for a little while. Here's what happens in Catholicism is that when you're sick and you're in a hospital and you end up in hospice, the priest doesn't come to pray for your healing He comes to pray for your spiritual cleansing so as you go to purgatory, you have a better chance of getting out. When Christians pray, they don't pray so you can get out of purgatory. Uh, They want you to get up. They They want you to get up. They want you to get it right, and they want you to be all that God would have you to be, right? So look at this one. And then he says, look at this. I love this. I really, this is exciting. It says here, um, um, pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Here's here's what you got to understand. If you were to follow the Old Testament scripture, when, when they use oil and they anointing, when any prophet or any king was anointed, it was symbolic of the presence of God being in the place. So the oil then is symbolism. Come on, say the oil is symbolism. symbolism. Nothing special about the oil. Nothing special about that, that because I put this oil on you, God's going to show up. Don't, don't make that mistake. God is already there. He's omnipresent. You kind of get what I'm saying? So don't think you carry him in a bottle that's all greasy. <laughs> Y'all get what I'm saying, right? He's already there. Okay, it's just that sometimes the sick people, person, don't know that God is there and God is in the, re- in the room. So what the oil does is it symbolizes an anointing of the presence of God being there. Now notice what that phrase says. The oil symbolizes the presence of God's presence while prayer is the mechanism, I love this, for tapping into the yeah, 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 yeah. So, so sometimes, sometimes, Sister Nett, you got to remind people that they have the presence of God in them, right? And so here's what that means. If you got to grease down their forehead for a little while, and whenever they feel the grease, they know that God is there. You do what you got to do to let them feel the presence of God, right? But then lock into this. Remind them that that oil is not doing anything for them because the presence of God is already in them. But when I pray, and I cry out to God, it's the mechanism for me tapping into the holy of holies and saying to them, God, I know you're already there. God, I know your presence is here. Manifest yourself. So when I pray, I disrupt some things. I wish I had somebody in here. When you pray, you break through some things. You just, I wish I had something. You tap into some things. You say, God, I know you're the supreme multitasker, but I need you to put focus on me right now because the sister is going through something, and God, you're able. And if I can do that, and you can do that, and three to four to five hundred of us cry out to God at the same time, we might just get his attention. I need a move. You kind of get what I'm saying? And we have to understand that. And the reason a lot of us are stuck, because we try to do it by ourselves. Are you hearing me? I'm going to get to some things real quiet. Look, look at this. Let's keep moving. So here's the thing. Christian's prayer should be mixed with faith, resulting in the healing of the sick. Lord have mercy. Let me look at, what's that, 15 Look at the first part of 15. And the prayer, it's a genitive, of faith. You learned a genitive yet, Karen? (laughs) The prayer of faith. Look at these hard imperatives. Will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will This is almost a statement of guarantee. You kind of get what I'm saying? 
This is almost a statement of guarantee that God is saying, if you do what I tell you to do, I'm going to do what I, you can't get what I'm saying? And here, here's the interesting about that word save right there, right? That word save, um, more times when James or Paul uses save is the Greek word sozo and it refers to salvation. That's what sozo can normally mean. In this sense, literally here, that's why I'm being literal. James is saying it's a literal healing that will take place. You kind of get what I'm saying. So this is why, this is why Jesus can go to Jairus' daughter and say, get up. <laughs> this is why he can go to the women with the issue of blood and say, stop. This is why he can go with the man with the withered hand and say, stretch forth your hand. You kind of get what I'm saying? This is why he can go to the blind and say, receive your sight. This is why he can go to the lame and say, take up your bed and walk. The reason he can do that is because Jesus' prayer was mixed with faith, resulting in the healing of any sick person he encountered. Right? Now, now hear me carefully. Hear me carefully. I'm crazy enough to believe that God can still do that today. I'm crazy enough to believe that God can still do that today, okay? Because I find James now, brother of our Lord in the New Testament, teaching us that he says here that the prayer mixed with faith will do that. He will save the sick. He will raise them up. You kind of get what I'm saying? And it's talking about this imperatives of what God would do. Now, now th th there's a caution that I need to exercise here. And let me see if this is where this comes out because I really want us to get this, okay? Prayer must be mixed with faith. And watch what the faith is. The faith is defined as this. The confident expectation that God will hear, hear, and God will answer. Okay? That's what faith is. The substance of things what? The evidence of things what? Very, very, very important. So when I go to God, I am not, let me say this carefully. I'm not obligating God to anything. I am just tapping into his ability. And my prayer says, I know you can. And I walk away from that. I know you can. And I walk away from that. I know you can. That's what faith says. And I walk away from that. Whether he does or not is his prerogative. Let the record reflect. You kind of get what I'm saying? And I want us to clarify that as it relates to what James is saying. That, that God will, God will, but, but it's up to him to do what he says he's going to do, right? So notice what Jesus did when he did. Before he performed any miracle, he accessed God for permission before he engaged the sick. Oh, wow. James 4, 5. Come now, you rich. You go do this. You go do that. All that kind of stuff. Shouldn't you say, if the Lord will? Here's, here's Paul in Corinthians 12. I had a thorn in my flesh. I sought God three times on it. And he said, God said to me, he didn't take it away because he says, my grace is sufficient. Here's Paul's prayer. God, I know you're able. I know you're able. I know you're able. I know you're able. I'm content with your response. You can't get what I'm saying? If I'm content with the response... I don't get depressed or dismayed because of the response. See, we don't understand this, and we go to God obligating God to stuff, and then because of the words we use, God ends up choosing not to do because we'll fool ourselves into thinking we are God, and then we get mad when he don't. I know you can, and I'm good with it. Because whatever you did, that's what you wanted to do. I said this a couple of weeks ago. Prayer is educational because it teaches us the will of God. You remember me saying that? Very, very important that we not be. So come on, say, it's in his will. It, I mean, it's his will. Say it again. Say, it's his will. Very, very important that we not miss that. I want you to see it. So look at this thing, okay? So then here's the thing. Healing then is left to the will of God, not the dictates of the elders who are praying. There's a time when Jesus prayed 
and God did not answer Jesus. And some of y'all are like, <gasps> Yeah, he didn't answer the way Jesus wanted him to answer. And here's Jesus in the garden. Lord, let's talk about this. If it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Because I can't have nobody hitting me and piercing me in the side and doing all this stuff. That mess is going to hurt. Isn't there another way to do this? So if it's possible, God, take this cup away from me. Because I'm not feeling all of that right now. That was his prayer. This is God himself praying to God. This is deep. And the God outside of the God man said, yo, bro, you got to go through that. Because that's the only way salvation is possible. And sometimes when God responds, responds no, because that's the only way our sanctification is possible. There's things I've gone through in life that he let me go through that I'll never do again. <laughs> Had he delivered me from it, I'd probably still be doing it. And that's the problem with some of our kids. That's a sidebar, okay? We rescue the child too quick. And they don't learn the lesson. Salvation was made possible by a death. Sometimes there's things in our lives that we've got to die to for us to be healed. You guys are getting this? Y'all okay with me, right? I'm almost done. I'm moving quick because I want to kind of point out some things. So healing then is left to the dictates of, to the will of God, not the dictates of elders. So don't make the mistake of going arrogantly to God in prayer. God, I'm obligating to your word. I command that you heal right now and then go through all, no, no, no. Whatever you do, be humble enough to say, not my will. But always say this, I know you can. <laughs> I know you can do it. So my faith is in your ability. And I'm resting my faith there because I know you can. And here's what James says. Don't be double-minded. Don't say, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Just say, I know you can. You're broke. I know you can make me rich. I know you can get me out of debt. I know you can heal this. I know you can fix my marriage. I know, I know you can. I know you can. And I walk in the faith of his ability. Does that make sense? couple more things and then I'm going to stop real quick. Let me just hit this real quick. I'll come back to it. So then here's the thing that, that you won't like. This is where I'm going. All of this, all of this that I'm saying to you, James is communicating a communal message, not an individual command. Okay, I wanted to say all that to get here, then I'm going to stop in a little while. So here's what he's saying. He's not saying go in your private closets and do these things. He's speaking to us now communally as a congregation to speak about the power of prayer in the righteous. And I'll try to flesh this out, and I probably won't do it justice, right? So notice, notice what he says. You've seen this all the time, but you've missed it. And so the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he had committed sins, I'll come back to that next week, he will be forgiven. Then look at verse 16. So do what? Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. This is weird. This is weird. I could see that church in James's day. Come testimony service. Hey, man, forgive me. I've got a frailty in my life. I was looking at Sister Sally, and I got busted. So pray so that I don't look at Sister Sally no more. Amen. Amen. Imagine that in church. Amen. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Here's the other side of that. Accountability is in place now in the one who confessed to help them walk it out. Right. How you doing with looking at Sister Sally, Brother Thomas, or Brother Patrick, or Brother, Brother Vernon? How you doing? <laughs> you got to say, how, how you doing? How you doing with that, Brother Richard? How you doing with that? Accountability. Right. Man, I'm doing a lot better. Right. But here's what we do. Vernon don't do nothing but look at Sister Sally. That's all he does is look at Sister Sally. And nobody's ever praying for him. Nobody's ever helping him. And you wonder why he's sick. <laughs> the church is a hospital. Now, sisters, don't get holy because some of y'all be looking at brothers too. Amen. Yeah. 
So you kind of get what I'm saying? Amen, amen. I ain't going to call no names, but we had a consultant come to our academy, and when he left, all the sisters were like, glory, thank you. Amen. <laughs> I ain't going to call no names. Amen. And I want to say, see, y'all sick. Amen. We need to pray for you. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at men like that. Amen. Y'all supposed to be in a Christian place. Amen. Yeah. But, but you get it, right? Confess your sins. There's an accountability that's implied. Imagine a healthy congregation if we can learn to do that. Right? That you may be healed. Let me, let me hit this and then I'm going to stop because I'm, I'm doing it and I'll pick this up. Um, let, me, let me jump all the way down here. I want to go all the way here. So when exercise, the prayer of the I'll come back next week, of the righteous people are powerful. Look at verse, verse 16. Confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And then it says, the prayer of a righteous person is, has great power. And then it says, as it is working. Okay, um, I love that word working in the Greek because it talks about um, exercising or putting it into action. So in context, James is more likely saying to encourage the congregations, not individual, congregations to exercise or work at their option of praying more consistently. So let me stop here. And then I'm going to pick up with Elijah. That illustration with Elijah where it says Elijah was a man, a person just like us, and he stopped it from raining. Elijah put prayer into practice. He exercised the option of prayer. I'm trying to say prayer changes things. If as a congregation we can ever learn, and I'll pick this up next week, we'll back up a little bit, to exercise the power that's implied in prayer, we would be amazed at what God would do for our city. So here's 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Y'all got it down by now. If my who? You mean that individual? Amazing. Amazing. If my people, the nation of Israel, who were called by my name, shall do what? Quit walking in pride. My business. My stuff. My this. Right? And do what? Seek. Help seek myself, help myself and pray, and then do what? Seek my face, and do what else? From their what? Wicked ways. What's going to happen? I will what? Doesn't that sound like James? The Lord will raise them up. You can't get what I'm saying? The Lord will. Yeah? I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins, and I will do what? He. You mean there's some imperatives in the Old Testament as well? That if the congregation can come together to pray that God will do some things? Amazing. Amazing. Point to yourself and say, self. Prayer changes things. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. If we can hook up and pray, we can shake the foundations of this earth. Come on, Pastor Katani. Come on, worship team. Bow your heads with me. Bow your heads. Lord, my prayer, God. I know this is a lot of information. I know it's a lot. Jesus modeled prayer on the earth. And my prayer, God, is for someone who's hurting, that as a church we would be in the hospital and start ministering to the sick. And sickness could be anything, God. It could be a marital challenge. It could be a physical ailment, God. It could be a loss of a job. It could be, it could be anything, God. A wayward spouse. It could be anything. Loss of a job. It could be anything. Sick. Suffering. Something about prayer, God. That can revolutionize that. So, God, I want to retract and attach the thought so to meaning. That if someone is lost and don't know you as Lord and Savior, you can bring them to a relationship with you. That you can draw them to a saving place this morning, God. So as your word has gone forth, I know it's been long, God. I know it's, it's a long message. And, but grace me in that, Lord. Apologize for that for people's time. But God, if there's someone here that don't know you, bring them. Bring them. And during the week, you said to me, you want to heal. You want to deliver. You want to be God in our midst. So we bless you and we give this time to you. 
In your name we pray. Amen. Grace, come on. Grace me. I'll stay seated for a little while. Grace me. Then we're going to do our offering. Here's what I want to do. If you heard the word this morning, and you're not too embarrassed to say, Pastor, I'm going through something. I don't want to know what the thing is, and I want you to tell nobody what the thing is. But if you're crazy enough to stand up and say, I heard what you said, and I believe God is speaking to me, I want you to stand this morning so we can identify you as a person to pray for. Thank you, Jesus. Whatever you're going through, amen. Whatever you're going through, amen, amen, amen. This is how you do it, amen. We don't need to know nobody's business, amen. You kind of get what I'm saying? There you go, there you go. But we just need to know we need to be praying. You kind of get where I'm going. So I want y'all to look around the room because here's what's going to happen when we come Wednesday night. This is how we're going to pray. You get it? You get it? We're going to pray for the miraculous. And we're going to call people by name. You get it? That's what we're going to do. And we're going to start hearing testimony of the faithfulness of God. Why? You, you see why the song is so important? We need a move. You get it? We need a move. You get it now? Yeah. We need a move. You kind of get it? In my life, in my wife's life, these people on the platform, everybody, we need it. You get it? You get it? And I want to let you know, those of you that are standing as a church, we owe you that much. And we're going to do better. We're going to do different because we're obligated to hold you up to God in prayer. Does this make sense? And we're going to pray. So right where you're standing, Pastor Katana, I want you to begin the process. She's going to pray and minister, and then we're going to allow God to move and have his way, and then we're going to transition. Come on, everyone stand to your feet. Come on, let's all stand.